So you will see is Joseph Whitmore. Say hello. 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 <laughs> All right. Um, this is going to be a podcast. It's going to be a great podcast because it's Charles the Fifth. And um, but we got to do a couple disclosures up front. Um, we're not real historians. We're not comedians. Um, and this is an. Right, right, we're just not real. Yeah. We're just this not whole, real. This whole thing and is this, fake. And this should be a rehearsed conversation, but it's not. Um, but anyway, we're going to jump right in um, with no further ado and start talking about Charles V. And Charles V was born in 1500 in Belgium. That's just weird right there because he was born in Belgium, which makes him um, uh, a subject of the King of France because Francis and France owned Belgium at that time. But anyway, he wasn't. Um, he died in 1558. I'm just going to throw out a couple facts and then we'll fill in all the details. So he was born in 1500, died in 1558 in Spain. So he was only 58 years old when he died. Um, in 1526, he marries Isabella um, from Portugal, and they stay happily married until she dies in 1539. Um, we probably want to spend a little bit of time on her mom, on his mom, Joanna. They called her the crazy one, but she wasn't. Um, but Charles V begins his role in leadership at the ripe age of 19 years old. And during his um, tenure, he came into situations that involved, um, well, obviously, Francis I of France, um, but the guy from the Ottoman Empire, is it Suleiman the Magnificent or Saladin? Suleiman. Suleiman the Magnificent. And the magnificent Can you get closer was, to your microphone? Oh, 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 I'm sorry. And, and, and the uh, Magnificent was his real last name. No, it wasn't. Sol Solomon the Magnificence, his last name was the no, Magnificent. I mean, but I don't Did know. Did you change it recently at the courthouse? <laughs> okay, so he had conflicts with France. He had conflicts with the entire Ottoman Empire. He had a major conflict with Martin Luther. And he had several situations. He went through three popes in his reign. Um, he started, when he started, it was Leo X. Then he went on to Adrian the Sixth, and then finally Clement the Seventh. So he went through three popes at least in his short 58 years. Um, but I, I know there's a couple things that we want to um, kind of fill in the details on, at least I do. Um, and that's the sack of Rome and the imprisonment of the Pope. And also, I guess, the battle of Pavia, where he captures um, Francis the First of France. So he actually captures the King of France and the Pope within a few years. But then I guess we also want to talk about, he was clearly a Habsburg with the chin, um, but we also got to talk about his territories in the New World. His grandparents, you know, funded um, Columbus and whatnot, and he funded Magellan. I don't know why even Magellan's a thing because it wasn't Magellan. He didn't, Magellan never made it back. In fact, 97% of his whole fleet never made it back. But anyway, let's start back at the beginning. Um, can we talk a little bit about his mom, Joanna? Yeah. Now, was she the first Habsburg? No, she wasn't a Habsburg. <laughs> oh. He, they, well, uh, at some point, the Habsburgs came into it now, right? No, they didn't come they into already it were. In, 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 until, uh, until uh, Joanna. <laughs> they, they were too busy. Ferdinand and Isabella um, were the ones who finally sort of united Spain and kicked out the Jews and kicked, up, kicked out the Muslims and sort of made uh, Spain into a uh, theocracy, a very homogenous uh, unified realm. But their daughter, Joanna, they married off to the uh, Habsburg, the, the Holy Roman Empire guy, the Holy Roman Emperor. 
and no, Charles, huh, and then Charles is the daughter of the home of Holy. Charles is the daughter of Joanna. And Charles is the son of the Charles is the, sorry. <laughs> I'm not used to seeing myself. So Charles is the son of the Holy Roman Empire and Joanna, who is the daughter of Ferdinand and Isabella. So that's okay. the, yeah. So, so they, they you get that to be, already after one after one iteration of the Habsburg, he's already got the jaw. No, the Habsburgs have been around for a while. They just weren't married right. into Spanish. The the Holy Roman Empire, remember, has been around since Charlemagne. Sure. Charlemagne's the one who created it in eight hundred with uh, the Pope ground Charlemagne. So it's, what is this, 15 minutes? So this, the Holy Roman Empire, as Voltaire said, is neither Holy Roman or an empire. It was a bunch of little city-states trying to be held together by one person. But it had a certain amount of clout. Wait, say that again, though. Voltaire said, Voltaire said the Holy Roman Empire was not holy, it wasn't Roman, and it wasn't an empire? Yeah. Who, who the hell is Voltaire? What does he know? I tell you what. <laughs> we gotta do we gotta do one on Voltaire. <laughs> I know. All right. He he he, he was the, the the age of reason guy who, you know, was right. anti religious. But I mean it's true. It certainly wasn't Roman. There was nothing Roman about it, right? It was uh it, it wasn't in Rome. It didn't really own any Rome except, you know, any of the uh Italian except, you know, a little bit it was always fighting over. And then it sure the hell wasn't holy. But uh in their mind they were holy. Huh? They got the Spanish Inquisition going. They were oh well, actually it was they were Spanish really because the, there was so it covered so much land, the Lutherans were just you know, it was so ripe for the Ottomans to take over because the Lutherans were fighting the Catholics. Um, yeah, yeah. So I, I think the big thing, well, well, I think what you put it nicely in one of these talks a while ago was that marriage at that time was just real estate law. I mean, they right. married, they, that's the, one of the funniest things you've said, and you've said some funny things. I don't know if you meant it to be funny, but it was funny. And it, it's funny because it's so true, right? I mean, they just yeah. married their kids off to everybody in order to... Uh, try to create real estate under their own name. And I mean, they were marrying little kids, right? I mean, little kids to old men and allowing them to consummate it. I mean, that that's not holy. Right. It's just fucking sick, right? right? But- Well, a lot but, of times they did get married as kids. So the, the Holy Roman Empire- Huh? Yeah, a lot of times they did get married. They married them as children. Well, yeah. and because Charles, the. Charles V was, um, they had said he was going to marry this person, but then they changed their mind by the time yeah, he was like seven. Yeah, they changed all the time. So he was actually, Charles V was originally engaged, if you could call it that, to um, Henry VIII's daughter, who was only six, right? Because they're both, oh, I, I think like, the we have to make here is that this is a part, the, the, the reason this is so a fascinating part of European history, the beginning and middle of the 1500s. It's like, it's the beginning of the modern era when, when modern states started really coming into their own. Their, France right. became France, Spain became Spain, England became England. It, it, uh, the Italian states were screwed. They wouldn't get together until the you know beginning 20th century. But the, the the major outlines of the European countries were, were were coming together, and it was all controlled by a bunch of twenty year olds. <laughs> I mean, right. Charles was well. Actually, you said Charles came into the Holy Roman Empire when he was nineteen, but he inherited this. He inherited the Spanish throne when he was like sixteen, and he, in, he inherited the the King of the Netherlands when he was six. For God's sake. <laughs> Yeah, and, so, and, and Francis from France wasn't much older. He was only oh, a few years older, really and much. Henry VIII was about that same age too. And they were all just world leaders running around Europe, just running a month. Those guys were talk about a minute because 
um, the the whole the, the diet of it's it's actually when when the Catholic Church has a get together <laughs> when they have a shindig um, they call it a diet right and they had a lot of diets the diet of spire and but the diet of it's verms but it's actually spelled worms w o r m s and that's where they laid the shit down with luther and said luther you are a bad boy and if you and you need to be um beheaded pretty much so um, they, they, they burn them at the stake they really burn at the stake they're really and, um, only only and they, only royalty gets to have their head cut off Oh, is that right? Well, anyway, so you'd think that would be the end of Luther. That's the beginning. <laughs> and over Charles's early reign, he saw his German states, and I guess probably all the way in the Netherlands too, just um, become, you know, not an empire, as Voltaire said, because they were they were not joined in any way, <laughs> you know. <laughs> And, it was, and how, how could you control an empire that is completely that uh, far apart and doesn't have any synergy? What, what does Germany have in relation to Hungary or Spain or the New World? How could you put together a consistent government across all that? Yeah, it was it was pretty wild. But I think I think what we should do with these next series of lectures, so this day we'll we'll start with Charles, then we'll go to Henry the Eighth, then we'll do uh, Francis, one on Soliman, and then one on the crazy popes, <laughs> and it's sort of sort of see the whole thing. And we got to do one on Columbus, because and mainly Columbus, but some of the other explorers too. But probably Columbus was the they were all ha assholes, but Columbus took the cake. So I think we have to dispel some of the myths that are around those people. But it was a fascinating time. There, there, was, there, there was the exploration of the New World. The printing press was like Twitter <laughs> of the 20th century. You could, you could write any friggin' thing you wanted, any crazy shit, right? And you could get it published and spread and everybody was reading it, right? And you have to remember the what is the Bible is like two thousand pages long. No matter what you believed, you could find something in the Bible to support it, right? So people didn't realize that, you know, this is just, you know, all the mixed messages in the Bible, you could just take one of those messages, buy into it, focus on that. And have yourself a, a new a new religious revolution, and that's what everybody was doing. And it was all because of the Twitter of the age. <laughs> yeah, the printing press was, was well in use by right then. It was oh, ubiquitous. It was ubiquitous. Oh, so but, yeah, there so, was a lot yeah, of. So, but, but Charles was twenty, head of the. But first he got like he he got Spain when he was seventeen, and like you said, the Spanish didn't want him, right? They go, we don't want this. <laughs> there's, there's a crazy he wasn't stuff in the Netherlands. He, was right? he, doesn't even, he didn't even speak Spanish. And they right. said they said, okay, well, we'll kind we'll take we'll take you as our king, which was Charles the First of Spain, because there was no Charles, and he wasn't the Charles the First of the Roman Empire, because that didn't happen until he was 20, and say, but you gotta learn Castilian Spanish, or you're not king. <laughs> so he had to get like a Berlitz type thing going, or what do they? What's that other? Um, yeah, where you learn of, a language real quick. Yeah, we, I forgot what it's called. Something yeah. Stone, Rosetta Stone. Rosetta Stone. Yeah. He did the Rosetta Stone yeah. of the fifth like version of the Rosetta. And he did. He tried. He got rid of his people that he brought with him, and he and from the Netherlands, uh, from Belgium, and then he got Spanish advisors. The thing about Charles V, all the way through his life, he was always just trying. He knew he had an impossible job, but he was just gave it his all. And it was never good enough for him. You know, he was um, an absolute monarch. But so the only person to judge him was himself. And he was his own hardest critic. He yeah, just always felt bad about everything. Yeah. Like, here's the thing with the New World. He told 
Cortez and all those guys, they're like, he's like, come on, man, all this shit you're, I'm hearing, you got to mellow out with the natives. And they're like, no, no, Wait. we don't. And they just freaking ignored him. Well, and he you was know, like, the other thing, yeah, sure. I mean, it, it, he did both. I mean, even Isabella, who I have very little respect for, except for she's a powerful woman and I like powerful women. But besides that, even she said, you guys have to stop killing all the natives. And the priests wrote back to her. There's actually documents, which, which kind of pissed me off a little bit even then. But at least the priests were going, these, these Indians are human, right? And as soon as they get converted to Catholicism, <laughs> you have to start treating them like humans. I'm <laughs> going, what? They're humans before they get converted to Catholicism. But apparently, according to the Jesuits, like, yeah, they're humans, but they're natives and they're not Catholics, so you can mistreat them. But as soon as they get converted to Catholicism, they got to treat them with respect. And then they said, well, okay, they can get converted, but they can't be priests. You know, they can't have any power. And then Isabella said, no. If they get converted to Catholicism, they can be priests. You can't, like, be such a bigot. So she did have, but on the other hand, what I want to say is after Charles and them dis discovered there was gold, right, I don't think he did that much to stop it, right? I mean, yeah. as long as the gold was flowing, he may have said a few things about be nice to the natives, but he didn't say, well, I'm going to stop taking your gold until you start treating them better. Right, you know, I think right. it was, it was uh, I mean, some of these natives, if you read about it, they kept them in the mines six, not, they can't come out at night. They kept them in the mines six days a week and they didn't feed them. Their wives had to get food and find them in the mines in order to get them fed and watered. I mean, these, you know, and, and one priest, I forgot what his name was. He says, well, he, he wrote to Isabella and said, you know, you guys are destroying the native populations, you know, Catholic or not, they're going to be dead. And what you should do is stop using natives to mining and start bringing over the Africans. <laughs> I mean, well, they did. What, how could they, what, what, it's like just unbelievable, right? And there's nothing, I mean, we're like 500 years from then, so we can't like shake them. But like in my mind, I'm shaking them. I go, what point do you understand human is human, right? Stopping killing the, <laughs> stopping to kill the native Indians so you can abuse, you know, the Africans, it's not helping, right? It's just, just not helping. But we're getting ahead of our story. We're getting to the Columbia, Columbian chain. And Charles, I didn't really care except for the money. Charles didn't have any control over what the hell Cortez was going to do. That's it. Or no. even even like there was one situation where he told one of the conquistadors to stop and he had to go somewhere and meet and the conquistador is just like, No, no, I'm not gonna do that. And he just went on. He just like it's like these guys were uncontrollable, right? Mm -hmm. They were. Pure, I mean they, it was pure they were going they and were uh, yeah, and if you read their thing, like they used religion as an excuse. They says, "Well, yeah, we're killing the natives and enslaving them, but we're saving their souls. So it's kind of a we're gonna balance it out, right? They're not gonna burn in hell forever. So they're slaves for a few years, you know, and we kill them early and we take all their land and we take all their money, but they're saved. So it so we're gonna we're gonna just write that off as an even exchange." Uh, well, but, you know what? It's hard to get through the day without a good justification. <laughs> yeah, Even in the 21st century, right? Actually, you know, the, uh, the unit of measure of money that we used in the new in, in America was the Spanish Spanish money coming from the New World, right? So it was it was it, it was the universal denomination throughout all Europe and even Asia and China, they were using the uh, Spanish, I forgot what it's called. Yeah. Well, the other thing about these conversations, we don't take notes. <laughs> we yeah, have sure. we we no read it somewhere. You but don't you know. know you don't I remember, we just that. make it up. <laughs> so, so Charles V wasn't one of these rulers who was decadent. 
he didn't have like all kinds of mistresses. He didn't get into weird trouble. He worked hard every day. And I'm going to estimate that the time he spent on the new world amounted to about mm, 5% of his overall time. And 95% of his time was spent in Europe because there was just, just shit just happening everywhere. It was, it was insane. And it was like, he, he was at the point where, you know, how can you be a defender of your faith when you have the Lutherans here and you have the Ottomans here and the Lutherans are Christians, but you have to kill Christians before you can go kill the, you know, it was crazy. So he had so much on his plate and nobody, um, well, I guess he had a brother in Hungary, right? He, well, yeah, always... well, he finally ended up giving the Holy Roman Empire to his brother and the Spanish Empire to his son. So there was only that, he was, well, besides his mother, I guess. No, I guess he was, he, he was the only one who united the two halves, right? So there became the Habsburg Spain and then the Habsburg Roman Empire. Uh -huh. uh, the, b before Germany, that, it was Spain were, Germany and Spain were, it wasn't called Germany then, but the German states and Spain were just a worlds apart. They were completely different worlds, right? The Lutheran dominated Germany versus the Inquisitional Spain. Yeah. You couldn't do yeah. it. That was as much of a difference as it was to go to the New World. No, but a lot of that was his own doing. I mean, he did. I mean, he inherited the Netherlands when he was like six, so he's off the hook for that, right? And he took the Spanish, the Spanish Empire when he was like 16, 17. But when he was 20, he actually bought the Holy Roman Empire. It was because you did. That's that, right. That's how you, you did had to get it. voted in. So he had to he had to get voted in, but he bought. But everybody buys the votes. The three people right. buying votes were Henry the Eighth, right, Francis the First, and him. And he borrowed. He leveraged his way into the Holy Roman Empire. With, so he uh, started out in debt. Yeah, with 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 the uh, Fugger the, the Fugger Bank, believe it or not, he borrowed nine hundred thousand ducats, whatever the hell that is. But it sounds it's a lot. It's probably more than nine hundred thousand dollars. But I think so. he would think so. so anyway, so he, he he bought the Holy Roman Empire, and then the the funny thing, the the, the Pope was was trying to bribe people too, and trying to he, he wanted this other somebody else to get it who was he could manipulate but it, it, it ended up being Charles so that one was all on him and uh I think that's, you know, how, I, that's how the popes got elected too yeah popes got elected too they were all buying their way into the power because it was more of a worldly power at that time though I'm though Leo who <laughs> Leo the 10th or something he was a Medici he was a Medici pope he was one of the Medici. Yeah. He, he was and he was fat. really fat and he was decadent and he would just like, it was all crazy in the papacy. And then Adrian came in, Adrian the sixth, he was from the Netherlands and he was like really tall, didn't speak Italian. So everything was yeah, in Latin. Was, no yeah. one also, this is a, a side story to that. Adrian was uh, Charles's teacher. And, really? and and before he became a pope, he was the Grand Inquisitor. So this, so you went from a Medici pope to a Grand Inquisitor, and the Italians were not happy. It's like, yeah. so Adrian came along. I mean, he, he he screwed up Charles forever, probably right. I mean, mentally, and then along with Isabella, poor Charles was a mess. I mean, he had all these scary dreams of God hating him and stuff which is probably true, he probably did, but, and then. But then after Adrian Clement, and Clement the Seventh, he was the one, oh, he, he forbade Henry the Eighth. He, he said, no, you can't get a divorce. And then Henry the Eighth, oh, eh, and the uh, Church of England and all that. But then. Right, but right, also, but the reason, the reason, uh, sorry. The reason he didn't want to give the divorce, which is really weird because of consanguinity thing again, 
they were all marrying each other's friggin' sisters and first cousins and mothers. It's like, what's up with this in Henry VIII? It should have been a done deal, right? But the problem is he was afraid of Charles and Charles's sister was married to Henry VIII, right? Right, Isabella of Aragon. Charles is going, you can't. Or Catherine of Aragon. Catherine of Aragon, right? Catherine of Aragon was the sister of Charles, which was funny because even though his sister was married to his brother, they were gonna marry his. It doesn't make any freaking sense, right? Because he, they were, he, at one time Charles V was engaged to Catherine of Aragon and Henry VIII's daughter. What? What? Uh, <laughs> Just, well, I, I think it's funny that it was Clement the Seventh who. Um, he he just couldn't do anything right. The guy, you know, he kept switching sides, and when he switched sides against Charles to go with Francis, that was a huge mistake because Francis loses, gets captured, and then the sack of Rome, and then so that was so crazy. So Charles's troops. And he had to backpedal his way out of this one for years. So they, his troops, the imperial troops, sack Rome, and they capture the Pope. And that's, that's not good, because all of Europe was like, no, you can't. And then, and then Charles V was, was in Spain at the time, and he's like, oh, yes, I'm so sorry for my troops being... Um, mischievous you know i want to come and kiss your feet when the reality was he wanted to jump for joy because now he could make sure that he would be crowned the holy roman emperor because he had all the leverage in the world and he was uh and he could keep his daughter Mary, his sister married to the holy roman uh, to, to henry the eighth also we have to remember those soldiers who sacked rome were lutheran. were freaking lutherans right i know so he, so Charles V, the Catholic emperor, imprisoned the Pope using Lutheran troops. I mean, so you can imagine how much the, this is when the Lutherans and uh, Catholics, it, that whole thing had turned extremely violent, right? They hated each other at that point. And so the Lutherans are not going to have any mercy on a friggin' idolater antichrist, right? Because the Lutherans thought, Literally, the world was coming into the most Christians do. They thought the world was going to end for the past 2,000 years. But these people really, well, really did. And they thought uh, the Pope was the Antichrist, right? So these people who were taking the Pope were not being respectful, right? You don't, you don't respect the Antichrist. And so, so they were running around Rome with like his jewels and they were like making fun of them. They 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 went through the through the papal. They went through all the churches. They took all the gold from the churches. They broke into nunneries and raped the nuns, which was okay because they're all like part of the Antichrist, right? It's it's like it was merciless. And then the Clement forgave him. <laughs> you look right. at Charles had all the power, so. Cause I was oh one thing. If you can, there's one book I'm gonna I'm gonna sort of press. I have no 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 monetary thing in this but it's the uh defenders of the faith if, if you oh, get yeah 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 if you get that this one it goes through this whole story of all these crazy characters and the other thing to remember is some of those popes were like 35 right they weren't old now now when we think of a pope you think of like someone who's like 150 or something right but these people bought the pope heard the pope hood is that a word the pope but they bought the Pope heard, and they were like papacy. They broke. They bought themselves into the papacy, and they were relatively young men too. I mean, they weren't in their twenties, but they were uh, in, in the young. Men, they were relatively what we would call young adults. And well, uh, they had to get after it and get going because, like we said, um, Charles died at fifty-eight. Francis died about the same age. Henry VIII died about the same age. So they never even made it to 60. They all had gout. Gout was the disease <laughs> oh, okay. of the... From all the red <laughs> meat. You know, the only one who survived into his 70s was Solomon. And a of few of course. 
Yeah. Those guys were badass. Solomon was having fun. He he lived until he was like 76 or so. He outlived all of them. So uh, uh, yeah, there's so much in that book, the the Knights of Rhodes. I mean that that oh, book yeah. did for Solomon. And um, wow, if it wasn't for Solomon having the same problem that Charles had in that he had his own factions in Islam that he had to quell. Um, or maybe yeah, he could yeah. have done more damage. Who yeah, that's knows? the only thing. So as the Catholic, Catholic Europe was dealing with the Protestant Reformation, the Islamic Empire was dealing with the Sunnis, right, in 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 Baghdad. So the, so Suleiman and Suleiman's father and grandfather spent a lot of time trying to just trying to put down the Sunni rebellion, which they didn't. Obviously, I wouldn't have known that Iran is still Sunni, right. But what's but, funny is that they write these letters. They're so eloquent, you know, and, and Suleiman writes to his Sunni person that he's like, the only reason that I haven't, the only reason you're still alive is because I haven't got to you yet. Cause I've been busy conquering the roads. And stuff. My but yeah. You just chill. And, and they all were so eloquent when they wrote, I mean, they, well, actually, when they were writing, that wasn't so much the printing press because those were individual direct messages. They weren't a Twitter feed um, when they would write back to themselves. And they did. Yeah, that, they were that, always that, writing. That was more like email, I guess, right? They were sending. Yeah, that was like email. The printing right. press was, was Twitter. <laughs> but, okay, Mark so, Luther so, yeah. just so, used Twitter. So what I thought was funny, and again, they, they bring it up in the book and some other uh, sources, was that... Charles hired the Lutherans to attack the Pope, but France was getting in cahoots with with uh, Solomon to <laughs> right. Well, France Francis wrote Solomon when he was in prison said, "Hey, can you help me out? I'm in prison here." And so I, I think Suleiman sort of blew him off, right? But yeah, says, I'm, not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not going to go all the way to France to get you out of jail. If I could, I would, I'm sure. But I don't think his it's reply happen. was like, "Yes, it, it is so and, sad and, to and, see." And then Charles know. tried to get into cahoots with the. He actually did get into cahoots with the uh, with the uh, Sunni against Suleiman, right? So all this stuff would wear you down, but I just don't see. It's like, so yeah, so France, at that time, Henry VIII was still Catholic. Um, Charles was actually Catholic. France was, Francis was Catholic. The Pope was Catholic. And they were all at each other's throats and using these off principle, the Muslims and the Lutherans to, to help fight other Catholics. It's, yeah. it's, it's like so, why? I don't know if they're all Catholics. Why can't they friggin' get along? What about love your neighbor and turn it the? Was all, it was pretty complicated, but the um, Charles he gets to the end. He's got gout. He can't walk. They have to carry him around. He um, gives up his throne to. He splits it into um, his yeah. son gets the gets Spain Philip, and then Philip the second New World and uh, and he gives um, like the German states away and he I think that he died depressed. Um, he he clearly he just he advocated the throne. He's like at like probably 56, 57 he was feeling not good and he just like I'm done. Um, he wrote out good instructions for everybody to follow. And then he just went and chilled. Yeah. And I think that he was disappointed that he worked so hard and everything, the, 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 they had went bankrupt and stuff. Well, I guess, no, that was his grandpa. But, you know, they were always out of money, out of friends. They, 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 he, he, he was bankrupt many times, many times, even with all the gold from, I mean, the, what I think we talked about it before, the gold from uh, Europe just ended up causing magic massive inflation because of their lack of understanding of economic theory. You just don't print money. It was like Germany in, you know, the 1920s or 30s. It was just, they were crazy. But, but Charles is, Charles V, I think, is the only absolute monarch that had a personality profile that didn't include, you know, being 
uh, a narcissist because a narcissist definitely that it helps you when you're an absolute monarch. He really wasn't a narcissist. In fact, he was like, you know, he was like, dang, dang it. Yeah, Mark. actually, he, he would get mad and do crazy well, stuff, but he, he was still. He was, he, well, he was an absolute monarch, and, and I think he got himself in over his head. But his last letter that's published, you can read it, and he says in his last letter before he dies, he's like, he says, I'm sorry. <laughs> I am really sorry. I screwed up, and I screwed up bad. And initially, it was because I was so young, right? I mean, I got into this way too young and I wasn't prepared and I made a lot of mistakes and hurt a lot of people. And later I was just arrogant and then I was old and none of that's an excuse, but I screwed up and I'm sorry. Good you know, luck. I think, so, I mean, what I, other, cool. I, don't, I don't think any other absolute monarch ever apologized. I mean, no, so, and, and I think that if you look at it, maybe he, he probably did screw up uh, and he was right. He screwed up. But you know I, what? It could have been a lot worse, right? He could have, <laughs> I don't know been, how it could be a lot worse. How could it be a lot worse? He had like 10 wars with Francis. He had wars with the, he put the friggin' Pope in jail. He, what? Yeah, I'll, okay, I'll tell you how it could have been worse right there. He didn't kill Francis when he had him in prison, and he didn't okay. kill the Pope. He didn't right? And then he apologized for all this shit. But what kind of level are you going? He didn't kill the Pope is his big, his, his big excuse. He let Francis go. He could have killed Francis. Yeah, but he did. He, he made a, a deal of, with Francis. He, let he him go, and then Francis didn't um, didn't abide by any of the stuff that he said well, he was he, going to upon it, his it, release. It, 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 he signed it under duress, right? That was his excuse. Yeah, but, that's. What so how, how much how much time we have? Oh, I, we're I, way over. We're at almost forty minutes. You oh. know what? We're gonna meet back next week and do. I guess can we do Henry the Eighth? Yeah, do Henry the Eighth. Let me have one. Let me have two more. Two more minutes on on Henry the Eighth. Just a little caveat, little stories. One is that Henry he attended his own Charles the Fifth. Charles the Fifth. He attended his own funeral. He staged his own state gen, right. his own state funeral. He put himself in a friggin' coffin and had it portrayed throughout Madrid. And with all the horses and all the pageantry, and then after he got to the end where they're going to bury him, he got out of his coffin and, and went to the monastery. I mean, that's got to be. That's cool because that's Tom Sawyer did the same thing, went to his own funeral, right? Because you get to hear what people say about you. The other thing I, expect, I, I respect about Charles, he really did love his wife, even though he sold yeah. it. I mean, he was actually broke after he, after he bought the Roman empire the holy roman empire he was broke and so he prostituted himself to the portuguese he says give me nine hundred thousand ducats because i need it i just bought the holy roman empire and so you can have me for nine hundred thousand dollars so the daughter came over and um it was it was isabella too of portugal and he isabella ended up in portugal. and they always they loved each other she would he would write her letters and stuff all the time like they were like a happy couple yeah, he, he and he was he was very devastated when she died, and when he died, he was holding the cross that she held when she died. So oh. I thought well, that was touching. But before that, when he was twenty, he did have an affair with his grandmother. <laughs> so, I know, I read that. Yeah. So he liked the older women. Well, no, it that wasn't an older it. woman. It, it was it, it was it was uh, Fred. It was. Uh, God, it was the Holy Roman Empire's like third wife, and she was probably twenty, and, she, and he was uh, in her rule the Netherlands when he was like sixteen. So, you know, it, it could happen. It was his step grandmother, <laughs> but they had a kid. They had he had a kid with his step grandmother. Uh, the kid had a big job too. I'm sure. Oh, I bet. Yeah, that's how. They, there was no way they could they could deny that one. <laughs> Okay, those were the yeah, two. I, I can't believe forty minutes has passed. People are not going to watch this for forty minutes. It's too oh, long. sure they were. This was this was our funny one. But <laughs> we might have to do another forty minutes when it comes to Henry the Eighth. Just for God's sake, yeah, Henry the Eighth is great. The whole situation because he started out pretty cool and just got worse and worse and worse. All right. Well, thank you everybody for listening. 
thanks for great courses. Um, www.patreon.com backslash Wida if you want to support us or listen to our theme song. And we will be back next week. Thank you so much for listening. Okay, thanks. Uh oh. You got to press stop. Yeah, no, what? <laughs> this should be recording right now. I can't even find our stupid Zoom anymore. Okay. It should save. Yeah. Did you stop recording? Otherwise, you're going to have to edit it. You're still recording.